Welcome to MEB. This is episode 3, Process Classification. In the last episode, I defined the term process from a chemical engineering perspective. Here, I will discuss the different fundamental types of processes. This is important because certain terms in the general balance equation will cancel based on the type of process. The first type of classification to make is batch versus semi-batch versus continuous. Every process can be defined as one of these three possibilities. In a batch process, there are no flowing inputs or outputs. Materials are input to the process unit before the operation begins and removed after the process is complete. There are tons of examples of batch processes in everyday life. Baking a batch of cookies or washing a load of laundry, just to name two. For a batch process, both the input and output terms can be set to zero in the general balance equation. In a semi-batch process, there is a flowing input and no output, or vice versa, no input but a flowing output. Semi-batch processes are much more rare in real life, but the example that comes to my mind is filling the tub to give my son a bath. He loves to play with the flowing input of water. For the general balance equation of a semi-batch process, whichever of input or output is present stays in the equation while the other term is set to zero. Finally, a continuous process has flowing inputs and outputs. My example here is washing dishes by hand in the sink, which has an input of fresh flowing water from the tap and an output of dirty water down the drain. For continuous processes, both the input and output terms remain in the equation. Batch, semi-batch, and continuous processes have advantages and disadvantages. Batch processes are good for products with a seasonal or intermittent demand. For example, nobody needs antifreeze in the summer, so it makes sense to only produce it in batches during the winter. Additionally, batch processes tend to be simpler than continuous processes. Finally, equipment of batch processes can be cleaned or maintained between batches. In contrast, in a continuous process, the whole thing has to be shut down. The downside of batch processes is that they don't scale well. Imagine trying to bake 10,000 cookies. You'd either need an enormous oven, which sounds expensive and dangerous, or you'd have to do like 400 batches. With this many batches, there's likely to be some batch-to-batch -batch variability, since it's unlikely that every batch would be prepared the exact same way. Continuous processes are more efficient than batch processes, owing to the economics of scale. They are also easier to automate, which is good because the likelihood of human error is reduced, but this also may lead to oversight. Because many products made by chemical engineers are demanded in large quantities, a majority of industrial processes tend to be continuous, with production occurring 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 50 weeks out of the year, with the last two weeks of downtime for maintenance. However, there are plenty of examples of products usually made in batch mode as well, such as pharmaceuticals. The second type of classification of processes is reactive versus non-reactive. This one is fairly easy to determine. If a chemical reaction occurs inside the process, it is reactive, and if there's no reaction, it's non-reactive. For a reactive process, we must perform a mole balance because reactions are based on molar ratios. As I mentioned in the first episode of this series, we view a reaction as the generation or consumption of a molar species, so these terms must stay in the general balance equation. For a non-reactive process, we can balance mass or moles interchangeably, and they are completely analogous. However, since mass cannot be created or destroyed, we set the generation and consumption terms to zero. Although most chemical engineering processes involve a reaction, reactors are the only process unit where the reactions actually occur. All other process units, like separators, mixers, and heat exchangers, are non-reactive. The final type of classification is steady state versus transient. In a steady state process, the values of every variable within the process are constant with respect to time. This means flow rates, compositions, temperature, pressure, liquid levels, and everything else always have to have the same value, regardless of when it's measured. For steady state processes, the accumulation term of the general balance equation can be set to zero. In contrast, for a transient process, variables may fluctuate or change over time. Accordingly, the accumulation term, also known as the buildup, must stay in the general balance equation. Real-life examples of steady-state processes are very rare because it is difficult to keep every single variable constant. But as you can probably imagine, steady-state is much more desirable than transient because of the consistency and predictability. Indeed, steady-state processing is strongly preferable in chemical engineering industry 
but unfortunately it is just the platonic ideal. Truly steady-state processes don't exist because there are too many variables to hold constant. Interestingly though, there is an entire subfield within chemical engineering called process control, which aims to hold process variables steady. This will be yet another subject of a future course that you will take. To summarize, most problems that we will solve in MEB will involve continuous, steady-state process units with or without a reaction. Wrapping up, the learning objectives for this episode were 1. Classify a given process or process unit as batch, semi-batch, or continuous, and reactive or non-reactive, and steady-state or transient. 2. Write the simplified general balance equation for any process after the appropriate terms based on the classification have been set to zero. That'll conclude this episode. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.